Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Ask Axolytic Supply Chain Panel session for today. Uh, with us today, we've got our subject matter experts, Matt Russell and Michael LaHood. Last week, we discussed supply chain software selection. And this week, we're going to discuss phase three emissions. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. Hello, everyone. I'm Matt Russell. Uh, I want to start off by just a reminder of what the three phase emissions are. Phase one are direct emissions from sources owned and controlled by the organization, your on-site emissions, company old vehicles. Phase two is indirect emissions generated by the purchase and use of electricity in HVAC. So, you know, how are you getting your energy delivered to your plant? Phase three, what we're here to talk about today is all the indirect emissions that occur upstream and downstream of your organization's value chain. This includes all the way back to raw materials uh, extraction, right on through to the end user's disposal of the product. Phase three specifically are all indirect greenhouse gas emissions that occur in a company's value chain, both upstream and downstream, they are the most difficult to measure and manage, but often the largest source of emissions for companies. Phase three emissions can be reduced through a variety of strategies, including supplier engagement, product design, and transportation optimization. All right, so it's all the energy going into your product before you own it, and it's all the use of the product after you have sold it to the end customer that we're now talking about that we are going to be held responsible for some answers to in the near future. What are the producers of phase three emissions in your supply chain? Just a couple of quick biggies, right? So I've got some mining equipment up here first. If you have to go back and mine any kind of equipment, you know right now we're a long way from having um, carbon efficient mining equipment. Um, this would go back to any release gases or anything coming from a tannery, if you're in apparel and footwear, um, anything going back to really the source. Then, of course, uh, your transportation between or from origin all the way into the hands of your final user. Any third party uh, manufacturers that you use, any electricity that's going into their plant. Ultimately, you have to account for what your end users are going to. And I'm I'm from New Hampshire, so maybe I know what this picture is, and, and some city folk don't. But this is a this is a good old boy rolling coal in his diesel. So he's modified the engine, and he's just spitting out black smoke. So somehow, uh, the folks at GM and Ford have to account for this user. And then ultimately, how what happens when it's disposed of? Can that product be fully recycled? What percentage of it can be recycled? What's going to end up in the landfills or those fantastic plastic oceans that are floating in the middle of the Pacific? Why we care, right? So first of all, we, we acknowledge uh, that it has impact on climate change. It's more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. It's acidifying the ocean and air pollution. That's all bad in itself, right? In terms of where we stand with a social contract as organizations. But where it really begins to move is the bottom line, because that's what has to move for a profit-making organization. And where you're going to see phase three is in increased energy expenses as down the line, downstream, downline sources have to convert to renewable. Increased disruption as the Earth's warming increases severe weather events. Your brand reputation um, we know how fastly that can change uh, for those of us who are old enough to remember Kathy Lee Gifford's children's uh, apparel line that was being made in a sweatshop. Um, customer attraction and retention. Um, these kind of things do matter right now. Uh, I am, you know, the proud father of two Gen Z sons in their 20s. And what you do in the environment and how you present yourself in the environment does matter in their choices in the marketplace. Um, and certainly uh, government regulations are coming. And if you sell downstream to a major retailer, uh, they're going to have different, different expectations on you in the near future as well. Some of these external influences, uh, the EU carbon border adjustment mechanisms. These are tariffs 
based on your phase three emissions that are scheduled to start in the EU beginning in 2050. Amazon is in the process of developing and implementing a sustainability plan with the goal of being carbon neutral by 2030. So if you feed into them, they're going to be coming after you for your supply chain emissions data. Um, and Walmart, in partnership with the Carbon Disclosure Process Project, Walmart is actually providing financial incentives to their suppliers right now who are working to reduce emissions. So right now is a chance for you, depending on who your customer base is, to possibly reach forward in the supply chain and see if there's any monies for you available there to begin this tracking process. Right. So this is this is the quote that is as old as khaki slacks itself. But you really do have to eat an elephant one bite at a time. So, you know, start small, identify key phase three categories. Don't try to identify them all. Go after, you know, it's we're good at ABC segmentation, XYZ segmentation. Do the same things with your emissions. Go after your A's first. You know, take supplier surveys, understand what's out there for industry benchmarks. Input output analysis, I believe, is where everyone's going to ultimately end up going in one way or another. And then you need to calculate the emissions. Uh, there's a number of calculators available online. You can create your own internal calculator and set targets, track progress, right? This is not any different than what we have when we're going in with a delivery problem or an inventory problem, right? We need to measure it so we can manage it. And that's where we start. We need to start with the measurement. So what do we need to do? I think we need a software solution that can collect and manage data. We can put the, cal the phase three emissions calculator right in it. We can set and track our progress towards reductions, re uh, reductions in those targets. And it can be successfully deployed external to your org. This is not going to be an org internal deployment. This is going to require either data coming in straight through a CSV file or you co in cooperation with your supply chain filling this out. And, and then, you know, ultimately report on this. And for me in the connected planning world, this screams as a perfect opportunity for Anaplan, right? You start with one use case. This is maybe your main supplier's emissions and you get it down and you understand it and it's phase one. Phase two, you roll it out to your next three largest suppliers and, and downward. So Anaplan lets you start small, get stood up, start collecting the data, understand, and then lets you build forward and expand so you're not locked into a final solution for something that's coming in 15 years to a real point where it's going to be probably auditable by external forces. You know, the executive decisions happening right now is who's putting the bill for this activity. You know, can your brand afford to ignore it? Is your point of sale comfortable with it being a back burner issue for, for your organization? I think these are all questions uh, that should be being answered in um, strategy meetings for your organization. And then, you know, my final thoughts on terms of who's going to pay for the reduction in tracking, you know, at least where I've been on consumer product goods, specifically in the apparel and footwear territory, we've spent the last 30 years squeezing suppliers' margins for a penny and a half. A lot of our supply chain has been pressed artificially thin at this point. And to think that we're going to be able to go out and dump this cost and just pass it down the supply chain, I don't think that it is very realistic when we look at the size of the elephant. Uh, consumers are going to see some upward pricing pressure, right? Everybody wants everything made in America, but they love their $500 television set hanging on the wall. Um, this is going to be some of the same things. We're going to see upward pricing pressure on customers, right? Your organizations. You're going to have new cost of business doing in your COGS, as well as that's going to be hitting your OPEX as well. Um, so it's both sides, both sides between gross profit and adjusted EBITDA, it's going to be impacting you. And ultimately, uh, as we talked about Euro, our, uh, the European Union already being on track for 2050, we should be looking now for tax incentives, penalties. We should be looking for funding of R&D. Um, even in a software package right now, because I think it's out there and there's particularly underneath current administrative laws, um, it's worth uh, the exploration with someone who knows the, the tax law in terms of what you can do uh, for some of your tax incentives there. 
Chris, Mike, anything on what I just spilled through for the last 15, 20 minutes? Uh, yes, Matt. I, I was just going to po point out that, you know, you mentioned early in one of your slides, you know, like company-owned vehicles and whatnot, and a significant portion of the scope three is your uh, transportation and distribution process. But as big as that is, there's also a, a piece that companies need to look at and that people need to think about. And that's also your employee commuting and business travel. Because both of those in a large corporation can can be a significant impact to our carbon tracking, right? So when Absolutely. companies want to sit down and look at this, they really need to cast a wide net to see where all their scope three carbon emissions are happening. And, and right. look outside the box at things you normally wouldn't think about when you're thinking about company expenses. But again, your employee commute if you're a large corporation in a major city and people are driving could be a very huge impact. So just something to think about. Yeah, exactly. Good point. So when Matt first came up with the idea to do this topic for this week's webinar, I was actually pretty pleased because I didn't know much about it, but it's a, an issue. It's part of an issue that of course I'm, I personally am passionate about. So what I wanted to do was take a look at this, through a slightly different lens and, and try to understand what the costs are to a business to go ahead and, and eliminate or to modernize your, your supply chain to eliminate emissions versus what are the costs to the world, to society of not reducing emissions. So let me go through the points I found um, uh, when, I, when I researched this. So first of all, the, it's the initial investment. So modernizing a supply chain to eliminate emissions, that requires a substantial investment upfront. It's in renewable energy, energy efficient technologies, other sustainable practices. And it, this also includes the whole process of retrofitting, upgrading, and even re-engineering processes and systems. So right off the bat, you're, you're hit with a big cost. Then you've got to add operational costs. While some clean technologies and practices may reduce long-term operational costs, solar, for example, um, the initial adoption and integration of new technologies and processes may increase operating costs in the short term. Also, there's going to be a transition period. During the transition to a low emission supply chain, companies may experience a period of adjustment where old and new systems coexist, potentially leading to inefficiencies and added costs. Then there's regulatory compliance. Um, also, companies are going to be facing costs related to compliance with emissions reductions uh, and with the regulations regarding that, and also reporting requirements to, to the government agency. So there's a lot uh, to consider there. Then there's also disruption, disruptions to the supply chain. Modernizing the supply chain can disrupt established processes and relationships with suppliers and partners. This also can potentially lead to problems. Um, and then lastly, the innovation costs. So developing or adopting innovative technologies and practices may require research and development of investments, which can, which can in and of themselves be quite costly. So that's like the side of you know, okay, this is how much it's going to cost to achieve this. You know, who's going to bear, the, as, as Matt had brought up on a prior slide, who's going to bear that cost? When you look at the other side of the coin, what are the costs of society if we don't do anything, if we don't do anything at all and just and, and let it go? So number one, not reducing emissions contributes to environmental degradation. So it leads to problems like air pollution, water pollution, deforestation, habitat destruction, and climate change, among others. So these Issues can have health implications, uh, everything from respiratory illness to cardiovascular diseases, ranges of other health problems, um, and of, of course, more health care costs. So there's the, those costs. Then there's economic disruption. So climate change and environmental crises can dis disrupt economies through extreme weather events, reduced agricultural yields, damage to infrastructure, leading to high recovery costs. And we've seen this. We see this in the news now almost every day. Um, human migration and conflict, we're probably beginning to see this on a large scale as well. Climate change and its consequences can drive migration and even conflict, causing societal instability and significant human suffering. Such instability may necessitate significant security and humanitarian costs. Then there's also ecosystem service loss. So the loss of ecosystems and biodiversity due to emissions has long-term implications for food security, clean water, and various other ecosystem services. The cost of replacing these services can be astronomical. And there's loss of biodiversity. Biodiversity loss can have cascading effects on ecosystems and human societies. 
uh, affecting industries like agriculture, fisheries, pharmaceuticals, which rely on diverse ecosystems. That's just to name a few. Then there's the infrastructure costs, rising sea levels, extreme weather events can damage infrastructure, leading to costly repairs and also rendering some assets completely worthless across the world. And this is, again, something that we're already beginning to see. So when you look at it from that point of view, you can almost think, wouldn't companies be doing this? And I guess what it comes down to is the money. And a lot of companies are, are loath to spend money, especially if they see they're in competition with other companies that may or may not be spending as much money on doing what many people would say is the right thing by going to, to deal with your phase three emissions. Um, but as you can see, the cost to, to society and to the world ultimately is much higher. So hopefully companies will make sensible decisions moving forward, and that will help us to establish better practices and better, a better world for our, our future and our future generations. So anyway, so thank you very much for watching our webinar. Uh, we've got other topics coming out on a weekly basis. We have a, a YouTube channel and we have uh, all of our, our webinars put, pasted there, posted up there. So please feel free to take a look and make a suggestion if there's any topic that you'd like us to, to cover. And I think that's about it for today.